Uh, first, actually, I want to give some highlights. So usually adaptive design in survival analysis is more complex than others because uh, you know the end point is time to event and also the recensing. So it's not as intuitive as a binary outcome. And in this presentation, I'm going to review some of the recent development in this area and also evaluate several representative methods through simulation. And uh, finally, I'm going to provide some comments regarding the choice of adaptive strategies. Um, to give you a representative list of adaptive strategies in survival setting, uh, first we start with those actually very convenient methods. Uh, at the beginning, I think there is a method developed by uh, Joshua Yonghua Chen um, so basically, if the conditional power is greater than or equal to 50%, uh, you can just uh, do whatever adaptation, you know, increase the sample size, etc. But finally, you still use the conventional test statistic, the regional test statistic, without any modification. So that's very convenient. And then um, Cyrus and uh, Polka come up with uh, some improvement. So they, they probably um, kept thinking about why actually it's uh, the critical threshold of uh, conditional power greater than or equal to exactly 50%. So ex they expand, extended uh, um, Chen's method to a more general permission zone and still maintains that nice property with con conventional test statistic. And uh, another method I'm going to talk about is uh, like Li Gang and others' method. So their method is uh, actually based on pseudo likelihood ratio combination test. So in general, I think in statistical theory, likelihood ratio test uh, contains a lot, of, a lot of like optimality features. But here actually, their method mimics some of the likelihood ratio test uh, uh, method, but uh, it's not a real likelihood ratio because of the adaptation. So that's why I call it a pseudo. And the most flexible method is the Mueller and Schiffer method. So that one is based on conditional error. It's not really based on conditional power. So for Mueller Schiffer method, uh, basically it can have multiple stages. But in general, usually we just deal with two stages. For example, we get some interim result. Then we can just modify the boundary for the second stage. And we can even modify the endpoint, you know, modify the population to have a more like an enhanced population. But in general, we, we, we try to keep it consistent between the first stage and the second stage. Because sometimes, even though statistically it makes sense, but scientifically or clinically, it may not make sense if you make too much changes between the two stages. So generally, there are some challenges associated with adaptive uh, methods. Um, so probably you are aware that for each adaptive strategy, there is always a group sequential design that is uh, at least equivalent, sometimes uh, more efficient. And also there are some logistic challenges in implementing adaptive design. And all those challenges can be found in like FDA you know, uh, guidance document. So a lot of like challenges. And also conditional power Another criticism is conditional power cannot speak for the overall picture because sample size is somewhat distorted. And uh, some people you know, advocate conditional error approach. Uh, but also there is some criticism about conditional error approach because uh, in certain situations it may uh, have inferior power performance. So now, now let's get to the uh, promising zone approach proposed by Cyrus and uh, um, stored. Uh, so the formula is uh, provided here. The permissive zone is determined by the following formula. So it looks a lot, uh, quite uh, complicated, but actually in terms of implementation, it's quite straightforward. Uh, so in this formula, I think the tilde means uh, incremental. So here I'm talking about the survival analysis. So for survival analysis, the key driver for sample size and power is number of events. So here, D actually means the number of events. And the theta means uh, the incremental number of events. And the star means modified, because we are doing adaptive design. So when we get to the interim result, we modify the previous planned sample size 
for a number of events for the second stage. So we use a star to represent the modified, and tilde means incremental. So we can um, actually, here the D2 star tilde uh, can be calculated from one of the formula in the publication by Saros. And when we can evaluate um, this formula to see whether the condition holds or not. If it holds, that means um, the permissing zone, um, we are in the permissing zone. So we can make whatever sample size modification, we still enjoy the conventional testing scheme. But uh, if it's not in the promising zone, you know, um, we just do nothing based on the method proposed by Cyrus. So the other method uh, uh, I'm going to evaluate to compare with the method uh, of promising zone is a method uh, called the pseudo likelihood ratio method uh, developed by Li Gang and others. So their approach actually is following the framework of uh, Poaching and Hansberger method. Uh, but uh, here their test statistic is a weighted test statistic. So you can see uh, the test statistic is quite like uh, um, similar to some other weighted uh, test statistic. Uh, but here uh, we need to actually solve um, the updated efficacy boundary for the second stage. Um, and then we need to like solve the following like equations or constraint. Um, to solve this con uh, constraint, the equation uh, is not so straightforward as the previous one. The previous one is quite a straightforward calculation here because you have to solve the root for a equation. And uh, here you can see obviously it involves integral. So the calculation is not so straightforward. You may have to use like a grid search or something to find that uh, a solution for the equation. So to compare the two methods, um, some simulation was uh, performed. So the general setup is um, a two-arm trial design, treatment versus control. And uh, for simplicity, we assume exponential distribution. Um, and here, actually, the event rate is kind of mimic the real-life situation. So like a yearly event rate is 3%. And uh, for type 1 error assessment, we just assume like treatment arm and control arm both have a 3% event rate yearly. And the power, for power assessment, we assume like a 2.2% for the treatment arm and 3% for the control arm. So there is some improvement. And as I mentioned before, for survival analysis, is the number of events drive the power and the sample size. And here we focus on like a two stage design. Uh, so the first interim, we plan 550 events, and the overall plan 750. And the enrollment is about two years. <clears throat> and uh, because, you know, <clears throat> for adaptive design, you will try to avoid like a gap in enrollment. So here for survival analysis, it's uh, quite relevant. Um, it's just, uh, uh, it happened to be the perfect situation for adaptive design in this setting because we don't need to increase the sample size. We just extend the follow-up because as, as the follow-up increases, we get more number of events. So that actually can uh, accomplish this purpose. Um, and eventually the simulation is going to compare uh, Cyrus method with uh, the pseudo likelihood ratio method and also against the group sequential design because group sequential design is used as a benchmark, as a reference. So this is a table uh, containing the simulation result. So you can see um, the first column is the parameter of the operating characteristics. So we are going to assess the type of error, power, and the maximum follow-up. And uh, there are uh, like four additional columns. The first column is for fixed design. So basically, we just see uh, what's the power um, we actually have like a four-year follow-up versus a six-year follow-up. And the second one is a fixed two-stage group sequential design. That's a benchmark. And the last two columns corresponding to the Cyrus method and uh, the two-stage uh, uh, adapted by Li Gang and others. So you can see actually here the two-stage fixed group sequential design has a uh, quite high power, 93%, is just for uh, illustration purpose. 
and uh, the fixed design, you know, if we only have like a four year follow up, then the power is only 80, 83%. But if we have like six year follow up, then we have more number of events. So the power is higher, it's 93.7%. Uh, so the, the, the power between fixed design with six year follow up is pretty much comparable with the two stage fixed uh, group sequential design. And if we use like a Saros method, um, adaptive um, uh, design by just uh, assessing the permission zone, actually the power is slightly higher than the fixed two stage uh, group sequential design. But uh, because um, we want to like increase the follow up time to get more number of, uh, to get a, uh, a bigger number of events. So the maximum follow up can be like 8.5 years. So originally the plan analysis is like a four year follow up at interim and six year follow up at, uh, at the final analysis. So basically the maximum follow up is a bit longer, is 2.5 year longer. And the improvement is not that much. Um, I will explain this a little bit later, uh, because if the designed power is high, you don't have much room uh, for improvement. And uh, the method by uh, Ligon and others, uh, pseudo likelihood ratio test, you can see actually even though they increase the follow-up time to up to 25 years, actually their power is lower than the other competitors. So probably that's the reason, you know, um, because even though it looks like appears to be likelihood ratio, but in essence, it's not likelihood ratio test. And the simulation setup is just uh, illustrated here. So 2,200 patient each arm, and one set is alpha 0.025. And the interim efficacy and the futility boundary is 0.02 and 0.15. That's kind of like a the, the, the parameter we used uh, for uh, the scheme designed by Prochin and Hansberg. Uh, and the fi final boundary is uh, 0 0.112. Uh, and the interim inter uh, information is uh, 0 0.75. And the no censoring is assumed for simplicity of simulation. So here is some recommendations after the uh, simulation and the investigation. Uh, so for survival analysis, there is some advantage. So basically we can adaptive, uh, to, to do adaptation on follow-up instead of like a sample size. And the cost will be lower, as you can imagine, because the sample size, that's a big driver of the cost. And uh, logistically, it might be more feasible because uh, you don't need to uh, have a gap between enrollment. So people will suspect that something just uh, uh, go wrong. And that could uh, impact some of the operation, you know, some, some unseen hidden bias can be introduced. And the gain of power in adaptive group sequential may worth the trade-off with slightly longer follow-up. And uh, as I just mentioned before, we didn't see a lot of like a power improvement comparing the Cyrus adaptive method versus a fixed group sequential design, it's actually due to, at the planning stage, we have very high power, 93%. Actually, I did a further simulation. So if the planning power is like 80%, actually using the Cyrus method, the power can be improved by like six or uh, five or six percent. So that's much higher. So from 80% to 85 or 86%. Uh, there are some like uh, notes regarding the method. So the adaptive method relies on Brownian motion theory. So basically you have to have uh, uh, independent increment between the first stage and the second stage. And uh, sometimes the sensory mechanism maybe depend on the treatment arm. It's not like ignorable. It's not uh, like random sensory. So it's a uh, non-ignorable like a sensory mechanism. And in that type of situation, you know, type of error uh, can be even inflated. And also there could be other violations, for example, like a proportional hazard violation, et cetera. So that can even confound with the performance 
of the adaptive strategy. 